Good morning and welcome to the People's Platform. Our guest tonight is Saroshi Nandasiri, founder and chair of the Women's International Foundation. Welcome, Saroshi. Thank you very much. So this is a very special week for women around the world and especially in Sri Lanka where women are expected to take a greater role uh, in bringing about a recovery in the country's economic situation. So tell us um, about some of the work that your foundation does when it comes to empowerment of women. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is a very special week. It's important that we talk about women. Organizations like ours, we, we work with women for women throughout mm -hmm. the year. But a day like this, it's very important that we get together and talk about certain uh, issues, barriers that prevent women from progressing and going forward. Okay. Sri Lankan women, if you really ask me, are very powerful. Why do I say that? We are very powerful because we are the majority. We represent 52% of the population. If you look at educational aspect, about 65% of the people who go into the local university system are women. Right. Um, if you look at uh, life expectancy, it's around 76 years. Men live 73 plus. Women go on till 80 plus. So we, we live longer. And also if you look at um, households, Mm -hmm. uh, household purchasing decisions, pretty much the purchasing decisions are taken predominantly by women. They say about 55-60% of the purchasing decisions are taken by women. So most of the, the companies, uh, the corporates, uh, their marketing budgets are spent uh, on talking to women, having a conversation with them. So they're right. very powerful. And also women, if they decide to boycott your product, they can do so as well. Because right. 60% is women who make that choice. And uh, for example, recently I, I wanted to uh, raise some uh, funds and resources for one of our programs that we are doing for fathers. And what I got as a response was, if it's women, Sarushi, we are more than happy to invest and sponsor but mm, because they're very important to us because they make majority of the purchasing decisions but this is men so so they back off so this is the power of women so sri lankan women are quite powerful we do have barriers in terms of the stereotypes still exist the gender norms still exist. Now, for example, um, I was having a chat with a group of men um, on, an, uh, on a, a different platform and something that came out, uh, we were talking about the extended hours of work that we are doing, um, uh, how our uh, you know day is being stretched, all that we were talking about. And all of a sudden, um, one person raised the question, do you at least have time to make a cup of tea at home? So these are the gender norms, the stereotypes. If you're a woman, you should at least, at least make cup of tea at home. You should like, you know, so indicating you, your role is the carer's role. That came out. I mean, he, it was never intentional from him. He's a very open-minded person from, and it coming from a very open-minded person, suggest how these gender norms and stereotypes are being, uh, to a great extent, socialized. Sri Lanka, m more than 60 years ago, we had the world's first woman prime minister. And we're very proud of that. And then uh, her daughter became president several decades later. Uh, where did it all fall down? Why didn't women advance in society uh, to take on uh, more gender equal roles and more roles of leadership if you really ask me all the women most of the women who have basically shattered that glass ceiling are either having a lineage family background uh, it could be educational background it could be um, you know some some sort of a um, support 
has been there for them to come to that level. But it's very few people out there who have been able to go out and shatter that glass ceiling. Because till we have not created that platform, still we have uh, not been able to really open up uh, and give out opportunities, create opportunities and platforms for people, for women, especially women, to come forward in those areas. Now, for example, uh, if you look at politics, we only have about 5% represented in our parliament. Um, if you look at our boards, uh, we have about 10% representing, 10% uh, of women represented on those boards. So it's not adequate. If you look at our gender indicators, we have two indicators which we can actually um, uh, get an idea about where we stand. One is the gender inequality uh, index, the other one is the, uh, the gender gap report. Both of these uh, indicators tell us that, okay, women have, we have invested in women in terms of the education, in terms of health, all that we have done. But we have not created space for women to advance in terms of economy, in terms of leadership. So when you are not given space and opportunity to advance in the leadership space, what happens is, Women are not represented when decisions are being made. So how would you create that space? There are a few things that we need to do. First one, we need to create a lot of awareness. A lot of awareness is very important, not just beer uh, awareness. Understanding is what we need. And also we need to uh, create that dialogue within the community, within the society, that, that will help women come forward. And also another thing that uh, we need to keep in mind is capacitating women. They need to be capacitated for a true transformation, not just training I'm talking about. We have done enough and more trainings over the past you know, I don't know how many years we have done that, but it has not helped women with that true transformation. We need that true transformation happening. And also uh, this true transformational capacity, uh, capacity building will help them in breaking that glass ceiling and to come to that whatever the positions they want to come. It could be leadership positions, it could be entrepreneurship, it could, you know, but on the same time, we need to help them further, further capacitation is, is needed and also building that conducive environment is needed for them to avoid any cliffs. We call them glass cliffs. Now, we said, okay, fine, we need more women in the parliament. So we gave a quota. We gave a quota. A lot of women came into politics. and But these women were not... Like what I said, there was no transformational, a uh, true transformation in them and that capacity development, uh, capacitation did not happen. When the capacitation did not happen, uh, what happened was they, they shattered the ceiling, but they could not navigate the cliff. They fell down. And then people pointed to them and said, look at these people, they are good examples. Women should not be going into politics. Look at how, how miserably they are failing. That is not true at all when you take a look at the world around us. Uh, I look mean, at Rwanda. Yeah. Look at Rwanda. Rwanda, they actually, from the constitution, they actually uh, gave a lot of space for women to come into the, the, the parliament, to, to the polit political space. Um, and, we, and they actually created a shared vision, uh, you know, where, where people started believing. Uh, they understood the importance and they started believing in women coming in. And they actually helped. They, they had a, if I'm not mistaken, it was about 30% they were actually aiming for. But ultimately women came in and they, they actually uh, comprised of 68% or something, something around that number in their entire parliament in terms of numbers. Right. And, and World Bank is also um, uh, reporting a lot of development in terms of poverty reduction, GDP growth, uh, economic growth, a lot of SDGs uh, improving with women also coming in 
to politics. So the, there are a lot of examples like that happening. And also the other thing is, why don't women come into politics? There are a lot of hindrance, uh, hindrance points. Now, for example, women, naturally, um, we have a problem with time. We are time poor. Why is that? Because we have a caring role. We are being given gender norms and all these stereotypes tell us, okay, you, your but, role. But what happened in the case of other countries? Because there are nearly 200 countries in the world. So this is not something new to Sri Lanka. Those other countries also had these situations. Uh, many of them have managed to successfully move forward. So how did they do it? And you have to do it very carefully, not haphazardly, not in an ad hoc way. What we did was just a tick box for us. Okay, how many? Okay, we want more women into the, in the parliament. Okay, give the quota. That's it. It doesn't work like that. You need to like basically create that environment where people understand, people believe in this, people support, and create create a environment that is that is more more supportive for women to come into uh, politics to come in because it's not an easy thing to do it stretches you if you really ask how much of time that you have to spend you have to have you you should know how to integrate your work life it's it's a very tedious task so women has one one side of it women have to be developed to come into politics to break these ceilings and to navigate the shifts and to win the support. That is one aspect. Second aspect is her entire surrounding, her environment um, has to be uh, supported for her to come in. And the third point is, now if you look at Sri Lanka, for you to come into politics, look at how many ticks bo tick boxes that you need to, uh, uh, you know, mark. So many things. Look at the financial uh, uh, liabilities. You need to have a lot of cash. So, uh, and also th there is um, politics uh, conventionally has been to a greater extent a man's play field. It has been a man's play field. Look at how the violence is, uh, you know, there is a, a, a side of violence there. There is a side of uh, so many things are involved in it. So for a woman to go in, sometimes they might be very uncomfortable with that environment, with that surrounding. So that could put away a lot of brilliant women who are destined to be great leaders, but they put off because they have created this platform, which is not ideal playing ground for the women. So that playground also has to be changed to a great extent, which other countries have have done to a to a greater level. Sri Lanka can do that now. These platforms, um, Women's Day, Women's Week, uh, these kind of uh, uh, dialogue is very uh, very much essential for us to do that. Without that background work, without that homework, you cannot successfully uh, bring in women into politics because we saw that happening and we saw how they fell off from the cliff. So that is detrimental. That will put off like an entire generation of women who are, you know, uh, thinking of coming into politics. We're speaking with Seroshi Nandasiri, founder and chair of the Women's International Foundation. Now, Seroshi, um, you outlined a large number of challenges uh, with the, uh, the political situation in the country, which discourages women from coming in. But it's not just about politics. What about other spheres of leadership and where do women stand in those? So in terms of economy also, that's another indicator we have. Our participation, women's participation is quite low. It's, it's one to three actually, pretty low. This shows how inefficiently we are managing the economy because women, when we, we represent the, uh, the workforce and majority of the workforce is also women. So in that case, if, if the women are not facilitated effectively, that shows how, the, how ineffective we are utilizing an important strategic resource that we have.
inefficient economics. No wonder we are bankrupt. So we have a problem in terms of economy in terms of politics we have a huge problem where women are not adequately represented now we i i just highlighted a few few points which in my perspective we need to address and also one of the key things that we have figured is also um uh, to do with men actually we have negated for a very long period of time, we have basically ex completely excluded men from this dialogue. So we have spoken, gone and spoken to women and women alone. So me we men were like sort of kept out of this whole, whole uh, conversation. That has created a lot of problems. Um, that has been reflected in our child mothers the numbers are increasing in Sri Lanka. We had very low numbers, but this is increasing. So numbers have come out as 167, something around that number. These are lives. So that is on the rise. We have seen the divorce rates in Sri Lanka. Legally, it's around less than 2%. But if you really look at the social divorce and the number of divorces filed per day, that's a huge number. So meaning the, the family, the family structure is also being challenged. And also you will see how the violence, the domestic violence, the harassment, how that is also increasing in Sri Lanka. So all these factors are contributing and, and actually highlighting a fact that the, the role of men, the active role of men in this whole spectrum, so, and also um, when we were working with a lot of women, um, even like really established women entrepreneurs, they come and say, oh, we can't go for this uh, program, we can't go for this exhibition, I can't do sales because I have a problem at home, uh, because I'm not being supported. So we understood this and we, we actually went dig deeper uh, why this is happening. And then we understood that uh, it's, it's really important that we also bring in men into this whole equation and this discussion. So with that uh, aim in mind, we launched a program recently, launched a program called Dear Father, with the, the assistance of Rotary, Colombo Uptown, with the Department of Summer the Development. We launched this uh, program for fathers because we want fathers to be involved fathers. We want fathers to be more, more effectively uh, engaging in the family and assisting women. Um, in terms of that, what we wanted to champion was positive masculinities. But, but shouldn't this be on a more nationwide it sort is. of level? It is. Um, where where there's, there should be considerable publicity uh, and it should be something which becomes the norm. Absolutely. I agree. I 100% concur with you. Now, now, I was talking about these fathers programs. So the predominant factor here that we are trying to champion and we are trying to bring up, bring out is to promote positive masculinities. We need to take out these negative masculinities, the, you know, the ones that is like really, really hindering um, uh, and, and not really supporting women and men and the society at large. Now, for example, when we were small, when, when for our boys, right, when they are small, we give, what, what are the toys we give them? We give them guns, we give them knives, we give them, you know, swords. So we are slowly, slowly putting in their mind these concepts and notions of violence. When you grow up, we tell you to be a man, right? Be a man. If somebody comes, hit right you attack if somebody attacks you you attack you you know these are issues which other countries have. also face yes example now when this was there singapore launched a program called dads for life 
there is a similar program in US as well. So all these countries, they have launched these programs. There are, ve there are programs um, uh, targeted at fathers, but not at the level that we are targeting. We are the first in this. So like what you said, we are going to do this as a nationwide campaign. We are doing a pilot in Colombo district targeting roughly about 5,600 fathers. We are actually uh, tapping on to the, the Samurdi network. They have a beautiful network which goes down to the, the village level. So we are actually tapping that uh, uh, network, but we are not going to the Samurdi, you know, that not only limiting to one, one uh, segment of the society, we are going to go across. So it's a cross-sectional um, uh, 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 sample that we are taking, group rather, that we are taking of fathers, so 5,500 fathers, uh, and we are also uh, converting these uh, fathers um, uh, as change agents, role models in the society. So through that, we would be able to spread the word of these positive masculinities. Now, when it comes to positive masculinities, what do we mean by positive masculinities? We are trying to champion three aspects in this. First one is equit equitable father. Who is an equitable father? Equitable father is somebody who will share the responsibility of household chores, who will share the responsibility of caregiving. These are important factors. So you share the workload uh, uh, with your wife, with the mother, and you, you, sh you support her. That is a very important thing. And also you become a role model, an advocate, an effect, uh, uh, active advocate for uh, women's rights. So that, that in, in that context, you become an equitable father. Second aspect is uh, you become a responsive father. Who is a responsive father? A father who is who takes personal accountability, who does not go into um, the victim loop, who won't like, you know, get inside a victim loop and trap inside. And, you know, that, that is where your drugs, your substance, all that comes into play. All these people who get trapped in the victim loop. So when you have personal accountability, when you are accountable for your life, and when you t when you are accountable, you are t you take responsibility. So when you take accountability and responsibility, you also become your own leader. We call it self leadership, right? So that is being responsive. And the third aspect is nonviolent to the mother, to your wife, to the kids. Now kids also we have a huge problem, right? Forty percent of the people. Um, who are going out of the country for foreign employment are women as per the, the Foreign Employment Bureau data. 40% are so they are leaving their kids with the father. So father has to be a responsive father, an equitable father and also a nonviolent father with positive mass involved father. What is the role of the state in this? Now you spoke of um, on the one hand, what the, the government of Singapore yes. has done. Yes. And at the same time, you are speaking of 40% of our migrant uh, workers uh, being women. Yes. Uh, which, of course, they go through, uh, they have to register with the Foreign Employment Bureau. So the government is well aware and many studies have been done of uh, what the impact is on the family unit when yes. when the mother leaves. Yes. Um, so, do you feel that sufficient attention has been paid to this uh, this situation? Um, and what more should the government be doing? I don't think that uh, women should go as uh, uh, maids or housemaids or you know like uh, unskilled labor. We need to like have a proper program where they are being capacitated properly and they are being um, given like a proper system where their protection, uh, their, you know, insurance, all that is being taken care of. So that, that system has to be there. It is coming. I'm not saying it is not there. It is to, a, to an extent it is there, but it has to be uh, done in a more structured, more transparent manner. That is number one. 
Number two, when the, the, the woman goes out, when the, it could be like so many different uh, reasons that she goes out, she's leaving the family. So when she's leaving the family, father should be able to take care of the family. Now we see even your channel is, um, you know, I, I've seen in um, your news uh, bulletins and stuff that there are inc incidents where the father is abusing the children just to get money from the mother, just to get, uh, just to ask the mo mother to come back. So they are, they are using children as ransom. This is not a good, uh, a healthy uh, situation to be. So when the mother leaves, when the kids are at stake, that's a huge, that will lead us to a huge social cost. If you don't look after your women in any community, it will lead you to a greater social economic cost. It will. Now, if you look at now, I, I can share with you since you were asking about uh, these international uh, situations. I went to a European uh, conference uh, conference couple of months back. There, uh, I met uh, a lot of uh, South Korean friends, uh, delegates, and they actually, when they knew that I was coming uh, from a women's organization, they actually flocked around me. I was thinking, why? Why are you flocking around me? And then they started actually pouring me with all their problems. They can't do this, that and all of that. Then I was like uh, uh, drilling deeper and then what I understood is they, they are, they are, they are the, the country with the lowest birth rate. So okay. they have taken a, a decision not to marry, not to have kids. Why? Because it's expensive, because they can't uh, pursue their career, they can't have their dreams accomplished, all that is there. They are not being looked after. It can be a developed economy, it can be a rich economy, it can be so many different things can be there physically, but there are so many things that you need to consider when, right. when the women needs to go out there and to progress. If that right. is not there, well, you have a problem. I'm afraid.